Shalom, it's Mariah Elisa, and welcome back to my channel, Mariah Shelley Village. Today is our third episode of my mini history lesson series. Today we're going to talk about what is Juneteenth. So before I answer that question, let me give you some simple vocabulary. Well, actually, these words aren't that simple. <laughs> but let me give you some vocabulary that you may want to introduce to your students in case um, they're unfamiliar with it. You are going to want to make sure they understand these meanings before you get started. So I have a list right here. Let me read it off to you. Um, the first vocabulary, what I wrote down was portmanteau, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, disenfranchised. Emancipation Proclamation, 13th Amendment, Confederate Army, as well with that, Confederate States, the Civil War, and the Union. Um, if they don't understand that the Northern States were sometimes, or that the Northern soldiers were called Yankees, and you may want to include um, the word Yankee in there as well. I want to go back to the very first vocabulary word that I mentioned, which was um, portmanteau. Um, I'm not going to go through the rest of the vocabulary because I feel like if you're American, you'll already know what that is and you just need to spend time trying to figure out how you want to say that to um, a group of students, especially if they're smaller or younger students. But I am going to um, explain portmanteau. So portmanteau is when you have um, two words that are regular words in a language and they come together to create a new word. Right, and so that's what the word Juneteenth is. It is an example of a portmanteau. So it's a combination between the word or the month June and then the date or the word 19th. And so together Juneteenth is a portmanteau. So you may want to explain um, that to students to help them understand how is Juneteenth a word. Okay, the rest of the vocabulary I'm going to leave you on your own because this is a mini history lesson. I don't want to take a long time. Key people will be Abraham Lincoln, Robert E. Lee, and General um, Gordon Granger. You could, depending on how lofty you want to go with the history, you could add more vocabulary and more um, key people. But for the sake of keeping it many, that's where I'm going to stop at. Okay, so what is Juneteenth? In a nutshell, it's a day to remember um, the release or the freedom of enslaved Africans at large in America, but specifically the state of Texas. And there's a reason for that. I'm going to hint on it a little bit, but I'm not going to go deep in this one. So I'm going to go really quickly through a timeline. I'm going to start in 1861 um, through 1865 is the Civil War. So you just want to make sure that your students understand that or just kind of, you know, reiterate that for them so they can zoom in on that four year um, span of history and the rest of the events that I'm going to talk about are within that four year span as well. So um, beginning September 22nd, 1862, you have Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, but the effective date isn't going to begin until January 1st, 1863. So about halfway through the Civil War, we have the emancipation of enslaved Africans in America. Right now, it doesn't immediately happen January 1st, 1863, but this is the beginning of that, you know, ball getting to roll, if you will. And then news travels slow, very slow, <laughs> uh, especially in the South, right? So what did the Emancipation Proclamation do? In a nutshell, it declared all enslaved Africans to be freed in the Confederate States of America. You may want to go into some further history and explain, you know, the country even being split up, North versus South, and, and what that meant, and what the Confederate States want versus what um, the Northern States want, etc. But for right now, I'm going to leave it there. Um, here's a little caveat, though. Uh, the Confederate States of America, that didn't include um, the states who remained in the Union. Okay, so there are five border states that were excluded, excuse me, five border states were excluded, and then um, there were four slave states who remain in the Union. I'm going to name them. Um, Kentucky, Missouri, Delaware, Maryland, and West Virginia, which at this time, West Virginia isn't West Virginia yet, but the counties 
that were in Virginia that would later make up West Virginia, it was that part of Virginia, which now we would just say West Virginia. So um, when I was teaching my sons, I have like a, a plate map of the United States. And I've also done this with just a laminated copy of a map of the U.S. So I'll show you um, my copy here. It's kind of all marked up as I was teaching them. But you can definitely print out some maps. I did where I had them kind of section off the south, section off the north. So if you see here, we sectioned off the south, we sectioned off the north. Of course, that wasn't there. And then we had these three states here, which for the sake of this lesson would have still been the northern states, and that's Oregon, Nevada, and California. And then we went ahead and put an X through those four slave states. Um, that remained in the Union. So even though they were northern states, they still had slaves. And then we put an N on Oklahoma for Oklahoma being neutral. Okay? And then in Texas, I kind of singled out Texas in a different color. Yes, it's still a part of the South, so you see my black around there, which I don't know that it's a pick up on the camera. Um, but just to show it to you with my finger here, we still separated um, Texas and the black as a southern state, but then I kind of highlighted the rest of it in blue to represent its uh, isolation, geographically speaking, from the south. And that'll help them understand even more so why news travel slow, especially with the state of Texas. Okay, so because of Texas being so isolated in that way, it took a while for news to get down there. I'll let you anticipate <laughs> and speculate reasons as to why that was so. Okay, so now by 1865, it's reported that um, there are 250,000 enslaved Africans living in the state of Texas. So in March, I believe that's correct, in March, the war is over, and then it doesn't really get to Texas until June. So let's speed up that timeline a little bit. I left off at January 1st, 1863 uh, with the effective date of the Emancipation Proclamation. And then the war is over, I believe, in March of 1865. So let's pick up April 9th, 1865. We have the surrender of Robert E. Lee. Um, news travels slowly. It did not um, reach Texas until May of 1865. So two months later. Um, if you remember the Blackish episode of Juneteenth, there was um, a little skit in there. Um, I believe it was called I Am a Slave. I'll try my best to find it and link it for you. Uh, they kind of had some dialogue in that skit and they were saying, oh, it didn't reach uh, Texas until two months later. So March, it ends. Two months later, it's in, it's in May. It has reached uh, Texas, but Texas really doesn't want to hear um, that they need to release the enslaved Africans in the state. So let's speed on. Um, June 2nd, 1865. Shout out to all the Geminis. June 2nd just happens to be my birthday. Um, the Confederate Army of Texas, I'm sorry, the Confederate Army of the um, Trans Mississippi surrenders. So this is unfolding right before our eyes. And then in June 18th, 1865, the Union Army General Gordon Granger arrives um, in Galveston. He shows up at Galveston Island with 2,000 federal troops to occupy Texas on behalf of the U.S. government. So it kind of ends up being a forced thing, right? Texas didn't want to willingly... Um, free its enslaved Africans and so the US government steps in and makes them okay so that's June 18th 1865 so the very next day on the 19th June 19th or Juneteenth 1865 Granger delivers the general order number three I'm gonna read a piece of it to you he um, delivers it announcing the total emancipation of enslaved Africans I'm gonna read a piece of his announcement. It reads, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves 
and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and free laborer. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness, either there or elsewhere. Okay, so this eruption of excitement and joy uh, erupts through the African American population, as you can imagine. And Juneteenth is born. The very next year, June 19th, 1866, uh, the free people organized the first of what became the annual celebration of Juneteenth in Texas. Of course, that catches on and it travels um, throughout the states. Um, there was a, a, a period of time where it seemed to not be celebrated later on um, in history. And there's reasons as to why. There's some historical proof as to why. Um, mainly just there are so many um, laws that are set up to disenfranchise black Americans, Jim Crow laws, what have you. And so it makes it difficult to do that. Um, then there's also the civil rights movement where, you know, segregation and equality and all of that. So we don't see the need to do that so much in the 60s. And then 1970s, the Black Panther movement and all of the issues connected um, after the 1970s, after the, all of the black issues that become, you know, historic as time goes through is a reason for us to come back to it. So here I see it in the 21st century, definitely teaching my children about Juneteenth and my students. Um, we, we go to festivals and locally here in our city in order to celebrate that and commemorate that. So before I go, I wanted to talk about some customary uh, things that you'll see at a typical Juneteenth celebration. Um, you'll see red foods are customary. The red or the crimson is going to symbolize resilience and bondage, um, sometimes even ingenuity. So hot sauce and watermelon and red velvet cake and strawberry soda pop, um, to name a few. And then also barbecue um, foods, you know, smoked meats and all other things that have come to be known as barbecue staples um, for African Americans. I also wanted to leave you with some discussion questions that you may want to ask um, your students and you can modify these as you need to depending on the age of your learner. Why do some Americans celebrate Juneteenth? What does Juneteenth mean to America? What can be concluded about how people celebrate and define freedom in America. Um, should Juneteenth be a national or federal holiday? If you want, you can look up when it became a holiday, a state holiday in the state of Texas. I won't spoil that for you. I'll let you look that up. And what should all Americans, and especially African Americans, understand about Juneteenth? Um, I want to leave you also with some resources. There's an HBO documentary that is excellent. I'll do my best to link it um, to watch if you have older students. There's also some quick clips on YouTube. I'll link those for you as well. And then I also wanted to inform you about the Federal Writers Project. Um, I can't do it justice, so I'm going to read it to you. It is a collection of life histories that consist of 2,900 documents compiled and transcribed by more than 300 writers from 24 states working on the folklore project of the Federal Writers Project, which was a New Deal jobs program that was a part of the U.S. Works Progress Administration from 1936 to 1940. And so um, these stories, they chronicle, I'm sorry, this project, it chronicles vivid life stories of Americans who lived at the turn of the century. Some of the writers hired by this depression era work project includes Ralph Ellison and um, Nelson Al Green and Mae Swenson and many others. The documents often describe the informant's physical appearance, family, education, income, occupation, political views, religion, and more. 
Pseudonyms are often substituted for individuals and places named in the narrative text. The life histories comprise a small part of the larger manuscript division collection titled United States Work Projects Administration Records. All this in the Library of Congress is public record. You can research your life away. I'm looking at that. I went ahead and pulled um, a few primary sources directly from that site to read to you. I encourage you to grab a few of you are um, a parent or you're an educator, just skim through some that you think will, you know, make a lasting impact on your students or will um, serve as a catalyst for some good conversation and discussion about Juneteenth and the historical events surrounding it. Um, I pulled some like that as well for my family. And I also pulled two that I'm going to share, one from a man, one from a woman in this video in hopes to inspire you to look up some on your own. The first one I'm going to read is from Jacob Branch from the Double Bayou Settlement near Houston. Mr. Branch says, after the war was over, Massa Tucker brought the Freedom Papers and read them. He said, we were all as free as hell. Old man Charlie so happy, he just rolled on the floor like a hoss and kicked his heels. The next morning, Mama started to do something and Missy cut her out. I ran to Missy and said, us free as birds. She sure whipped me for that, but no more, cause she's so mean we all left. The first freedom work I got was pulling up potato heels at two bits a hundred. I worked two days to buy Mama a turkey hen for Christmas. Anything Mama won't, I think she got to have. There's so much history in there. You can pull, um, I'm not going to weed through it all because I want this to be a short lesson. But you can definitely talk about the presence of um, mistresses or white, the, the white ma'ams or misses, they might say, or missies, um, some enslaved persons would say. But you can definitely talk about the presence of the wife of the slave owner or slave master. That oftentimes she was even more mean um, than the master himself. I'll let you take that where you want to take that. The last one that I wanted to read was by Katie Darling out of Marshall, Texas. And Katie says, When Massa came home from the war, he wants to let us loose, but Missy wouldn't do it. I stayed on and worked for them six years after the war, and Missy whipped me after the war just like she did before. One time Missy said to me, You're never going to be free. You were made to work for white folks. About that time, just to look up, excuse me, about that time, she look up and see a Yankee soldier standing in the door with a pistol. She said, Katie, I didn't say nothing, did I? I said, I ain't telling no lie. You said we're never going to be free. Katie, darling. So much history you can pull from there, too. I mean, here we go again with the, with the Missy or with the mistress, Mrs. Sometimes it... Um, would be called as well. I think this is so interesting because at this point, uh, both, you know, whites and blacks pretty much have the Ten Commandments down pretty well. Um, even parts of the New Testament are beat into these enslaved Africans. But the Ten Commandments, definitely one of them is not to lie. And I, I find it so interesting that um, not Christians at large, but particularly white Christians, uh, would beat that into enslaved Africans and then ask them to break that uh, in order to save their behinds. Very interesting. Um, so we had a lot of good conversation with some of those primary sources. Please explain to your students what a primary source is if they do not know. All right, that is episode three of Marasha Lee Village's mini history episodes. What is Juneteenth? If you like this video, Please like, share, and subscribe. I'll see you next time. Shalom.